Our next guest in the public eye is known as being a footballer, a chief executive, a chief negotiator. He started out his career as a youth player back in 1959, um, ended up playing nearly over 560 odd appearances, scored 56 goals, played for clubs like Blackburn Rovers, Birmingham City and Bolton Wanderers. Then decided to hang up his his boots and take on a role I'm as I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, I'm Vancouver Whitecaps, and and become uh, chief executive at the Professional Footballers Association, where he reigned for forty years. I am so so happy to welcome this guest to my Thinking Deeper Growth podcast. It is Gordon Taylor, OBE. Welcome to my show. Thank you, dear Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. A bit difficult to get here in this weather <laughs> and the traffic. But, but we made it. We made it. We made it. Thank you. I appreciate you being it's a pleasure. here. So you know that in the public eye, of course, people already know you. And, and the whole point of my podcast, really, as my viewers and listeners know, is to find the more personal, the more private side of Gordon Taylor, uh, the bits that people don't necessarily see. And I think that can always be quite um, difficult in an interview situation. So I've created a little concept. Have you ever come across a singing bowl before? No, I haven't. So this is a singing bowl and I've left it to the universe. Looks very to, attractive to control with all your stones around the, this. And, well, this yeah. is the thing. The crystals are all here present. And I I'm, feel as though I'm having my future ready. Oh, really? Okay, <laughs> I hope well, I've got a future. Oh, I'm sure. If you're going by your past, you've definitely got a very, very good future. I would say we. what we're going to do is we will leave the, the, the flow of the conversation to the universe. So what Gordon's going to do is you're going to pick out a piece of paper that has a word on it, and then we will elaborate on that particular word. So if you can take your first pick from the singing bowl, that would As be amazing. As ever, I will do my best. Yeah. <laughs> power. Power. Okay, so my question to you on power would be, is this... How did you feel when you were in power? Because at one point in your career, you were in a very powerful position. Wow. Um, how did I feel? Did I feel empowered? It's. I think you've got to be really careful when you say the state of the world as it is. And we've had, um, we've got leaders in Russia. We've got, I had leaders in America who I felt really um, didn't, observe what they should have done when they were in power. I think being in power, you've got to be very mindful mm. of not just the state of your organization, but the profession you represent. And you're almost as good as your weakest member or that member who needs help. And from that point of view, it's been a real battle for people, and especially youngsters, through this the pandemic that we had. And How about you as a, as a person normal, in, in power? As, as me in power, mm. I wanted to emphasize that the uh, talking about the PFA is almost like being a player. You were as good as the team you were in. And from that point of view, I was always, I hope, a, a team player, uh, but always determined to make a good influence on the team. And joining the PFA, I was going to be qualified to be a coach and to be a manager and coached at Lily Shaw. Terry Venables was my assistant and he was, you could see he was going to go to the top. Not only he'd been at the top as a player, but he was at the top when he managed England in the Euros. I thought he did a great job, but it's uh, in joining the PFA, I was mindful of the work of my predecessor, Cliff Lloyd. Did you feel powerful at any point? Was there, a, was there a moment in your, I felt in your the career only, where the you only thought, thing that I have about got a lot of maybe styles. being powerful and well known is, according to my missus, I can, I can get tickets for things that other <laughs> people can't get. It's a good part. I, I try and suit <laughs> my granddaughter, will say, Granddad, any chance of getting tickets for this next show? She wants to see the weekend yeah. at Manchester City. And I yeah, say, yeah. Well, I'll do my best. So being in a position where people know you does let you at least. Hopefully, get into restaurants, <laughs> but as for it's it's just about your hopefully personality. I do like to be. Um, my wife goes mad because we walk we walk the dog around the village, and people stop and talk, and mm -hmm. I like to stop and talk and engage because I think 
I really worry about the state of play of the world. If everybody's mm. going to be inside and only be on the phone or you know well, be online, in, in I think I, re I really am a great believer in social engagement and mm. joining the PFA. There was just less than a handful of us when I started full time in 1980. Though I'd been a member of the PFA as a player, as a delegate, because I believed in it. My dad was a trade union man. He used to stay up late doing the books. He was a, an engineer for British Rail, and uh, now, so I was a bit. I was really interested in that history and yeah. union. So yeah. my job, I felt, as we built the PFA up, both in resources, was to build up a team. Yeah. And so it was, it was necessary. From five you to about the power 65, the yeah. we, we, we developed. And I wanted, I just wanted to work with the FA and the Premier League Which when that did. started. Which you and did. And the Football League. And to protect the Football League when the Premier League came in. But I was really proud. In a way. I was proud, if you say, about power. I was proud of the power I had that mm -hmm. I was able to build up the PFA mm -hmm. and to emphasize programs like a community uh, program community program and just the other day i went to blackburn rovers where it was a it was sporting memories and the way that such old people kicked into that and the way that they responded it it keeps them sharp they, they knew more about me than i knew about myself to tell you the <laughs> truth playing at blackburn it's because you were a very powerful man gordon <laughs> i'm sure so everyone will agree in a way i've tried to use any power i've got as a force for good yeah Next piece of paper. Was that short enough this? or too long? <laughs> We're going to work on that. Okay. <laughs> net worth. Net worth. So do you think having a net worth is a reward or a status point? Wow. I've um, never been that concerned about my status, but I've been determined to do well for the people I represented, the footballers and to make sure they were treated properly, to make sure an average career of eight years remained at least that, if not extended. But as we've got, as the game has developed, unbelievable. I never thought I'd be representing millionaire players because I began when I think my first contract was £12 a week and the maximum wage was £20 and you got £4 for a win and £2 for a draw. But it's evolving and being part of the changes in the game that saw the Premier League, that still saw the Football League survive. Because I'm so proud that in this country, football is such a, it's not just a legacy, it's a link throughout so many towns and cities. It brings people together more than anything else on a regular basis when there's games played. And from that point of view, I felt the community programme was an essential part of the game, that football shouldn't be just about play, more people turning up if you're winning than if you're losing, but it, it should be the centrepiece of, of activity because it, it does have a special position. And the same with footballers, and you've seen the effects of the World Cup and the interest in that, and, it, and the game brings people together. And I wanted to protect the very people that were playing that game because how, it's, how do you think... it's such a short career and I wanted to make sure they were prepared for their futures after football Absolutely. as well as looked after while they were playing. How do you think younger players with such a high net worth are dealing with this, this new kind of way of, of playing football? I feel that youngsters have lost out. I've got grandchildren and they didn't sort of have their leaving dance at the school where they left and then they go to university and the lectures are a bit limited because of the difficulties in communication so i really feel this younger generation is going to need a great deal of help and from that point of view i was glad that we developed the area of thinking oh people suffer with mental health if they're poor but they suffer if, if, if they can be well off as well yeah. because the sporting profession is is one where you can have real ups, but you can have real downs as well. Yeah. And so from that point of view, I think mental health and welfare has to be very high on, on any profession's agenda. Agreed. Next sheet. You, you doing well? <laughs> I thrive on appreciation. <laughs> I'll keep I'll keep providing that, don't worry. <laughs> Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Do you ever feel is there a time in your life you could recall where you actually felt vulnerable? Because you have been targeted 
a lot in the press. Was there every time you felt in that in that state of vulnerability, powerless? I guess. No, I've I've always sort of um, surprisingly believed in myself and and what I'm trying to do, and know that even these days, you know, with all the strikes that are going on, people are worried and. People try to castigate trade union leaders as though it's all their fault when really they're genuine working class people who want a fair reward for the work they're doing and expect a government to help them cope. And from that point of view, be whether it's the National Health Service or the Bank of England getting things right, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's, it, it's really important. And being vulnerable... Now, the press, you've got to get used to the press because they'll come at you one day and you're the greatest thing since sliced bread and the next thing. you It's a bit about, what do you call it, really? It's um, smiling down the snakes as well as going up the ladders again. And from that point of view, it's a challenge. And uh, I don't expect or didn't expect to be loved every hour of every day. And you've got to be able to cope with that, especially if you're a leader of a profession where everybody says, you know, they, they want to talk to you about football, but it's not too long before, oh, well, they get too highly paid and they get this and they get that. I said, no, they get a fair reward for what's happened. And what has happened, of course, it's become, it's the world's biggest game. It's the biggest spectator sport. We should be really proud in this country that we have, yeah. you know, so many, not just the professional leagues, we have the highest number of professional football clubs in the world. We have the highest number of players and we have the highest number of spectators and it's it's no surprise that in this World Cup going on at the moment there's more players playing out there and reflecting the cosmopolitan nature of our league that we really are worldwide. I don't think there's yeah, a World Cup the team soul, without a player. So, it's, it's the soul so from that, that point of view it gives you a real chance to have that engine to do good and just the other night uh, Bolton Wanderers, one of my old clubs, invited me to their outside Christmas carol and it was great. There was thousands there. They were raising money for charities and it involved singing choirs from the whole of the primary schools and they were yeah. absolutely brilliant. Brings it back to that community thing. One last one for us would be amazing. My biggest win. Be a nice one to finish on. You mean on the horses? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, you no, know. No, 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 no. My biggest win. If you'd like to share some of that, it's not a problem. My biggest win for certain was uh, when I was at Birmingham City. Um, I got in the Bolton team and we, the youngsters, and we got relegated. We, knew, we were four points clear and we just needed to stay clear of Birmingham. They won both their games, including one against Liverpool who had won the league. We lost one at Tottenham and um, went down to Tottenham. We were on a special bonus. And having said that, I had a great chance. Had a shot. Bill Brown, he tipped the post, bounced into his arms. He kicked it up and it landed at the feet of Jimmy Greaves. If there was one person you didn't want to have the ball against, <laughs> yes, it was Jimmy so, Greaves. Yeah. And he, he got the goal. So that was a disappointment. But the best thing was after I'd gone to Birmingham, we needed to get a result at uh, Leighton Orient. Otherwise, Millwall, Millwall would have gone up with mm -hmm. Norwich. And uh, I took a corner. Bob Latchford, who was a great centre forward, he went to Everton later and he scored. So a 1 0 up. The Millwall fans invaded the pitch and one of them came up to me and Alan Campbell pulled out a knife. He said, If you win this, uh, you're going to get this afterwards. You're joking. So talk about vulnerable or what have you. I went, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're still going to go and try and win it. And sure enough, we did. So <clears throat> we're all celebrating in the bath afterwards. It was just great. And then they went, you've got to clear the stadium. There's a bomb implanted. And we just said, not too bothered, really. <laughs> Next <laughs> minute, <laughs> bomb went off. An incendiary device did go off in the stand. But everybody oh was all right. And we had a great night out. So that was very special to get, wow. get promotion. Especially I after I played... All I'd wanted was to play in an FA Cup final. I played in three semi-finals and never quite made it. I think you've summed up pretty much all of the words that we've just mentioned there, vulnerability, power, and just in that last story that you've shared with us. So I really appreciate the time you've given us today. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.